where there was about 5,000 people in a space being hosted by Lauren Chen. And Jeremy Boring entered the room voluntarily and began calmly presenting his logic and debating about 10 people at once. Who makes the Daily Wire the way that it is? You look, if you want to look for somebody to blame for the Daily Wire, you're welcome to blame me because I'm the guy who makes the Daily Wire the way that it is. There's something important here, and I, I hope my hope is that through the examination of the logic, what is important will reveal itself. I've said Jesus Christ is king, and many other people have said Jesus Christ is king because we believe that Jesus Christ is king. Uh, but that is certainly not the only usage that we've all observed on X. To pretend otherwise is ridiculous. So if you imagine this chart, we have the ocean, we have boats floating on the surface of the ocean. The boats are the words. Everything beneath the surface of the ocean is subtext. What we're trying to articulate with the words, if the words are tools. It's like asking, how does a shovel become a murder weapon when it is used to murder someone? This isn't hard. A shovel is not innately a murder weapon. Saying Christ is king is not innately anti-Semitic. It's all about how a thing is used. So if you're working with an actor, directing an actor in a movie scene, they're more interested in this than they are the words spoken in the scene. What is my motivation? What do I want in the scene? What am I trying to accomplish? So this is what, what is more important, what you say or what you do, how you behave, how you live, your decisions. There's been this whole Christ is King debate. Is that anti-Semitic to say it? Uh, is the connotation at the very least anti-Semitic? So that's what the space was about and how words, depending on what's beneath, can change meaning with what you do with those words. So then the question is, where do we draw the line with what we do and how we judge what we do? Okay, so what, are, what, how, what can we agree on? Treat everyone the same regardless of race, going back to the original definition of racism, regardless of gender, and religion. Freedom of religion, which is built right into the First Amendment. We can't pick and choose parts of the First Amendment. If you're all about freedom of speech, you're all about freedom of religion. So what's the line? Obviously, any religion can go too far, a holy war, but is there something short of that threshold? What line can we define? How about imposing your religion on anyone else, telling them that their freedom of religion, compelling speech, compelling them to say what you want them to say, using this, saying that you're only, you must believe with what I believe, even that's, if that's what you believe. You don't get to impose that on them and say, you have to declare this king. All must bend the knee, which is literally the words I've been hearing. Freedom of speech does not mean freedom from consequence. And I would argue that that's why freedom of speech is important, is because it allows consequence to occur rather than censoring speech and removing the consequence from ever being able to occur. Because consequence, good or bad, is how we can navigate the world if you have the marketplace of ideas. The marketplace the, is similar to the uh, competitive marketplace. I launch a video game. The audience will determine the success of the future of that game and how it resonates with the audience. So you, you make a statement, you're doing your best to formulate and bumble our way through the world and, and formulate those words, trying to articulate that deeper meaning. We use our tools, the words, and the best we can, then that enters the world. So you have to accept the fact that there will be the consequence, good or bad. Now that's not a judgment upon the consequence itself. The fact that that consequence has to occur, it's, an, it's a necessary part of that figurative marketplace of ideas. Let's take a look at some examples of, of that space when this can become problematic. I don't, I don't like that guys like Shapiro cannot, will not say Christ is King, America first. I think they forfeit their ability to lead. Okay, so when Nick Fuentes in that space, this came up to Jeremy Boring. So because Shapiro cannot, will not say Christ is King, of course he's not gonna say it. He's, he's Jewish. That's not his belief, and he has every right to believe and to choose whatever God he wishes to choose. The argument that's being presented here is that that now negates your ability to have a leadership position. And as long as guys like Shapiro cannot say Christ is king and they, they refuse to say America first, I think it's notable Ben Shapiro has never uttered those words. Um, I don't think they should have leadership in America. 
Okay, so a government under Nick Fuentes would require, by that logic, would require compelled speech. You would have to say what he wants you to say in order to even have a leadership position in government. You would have to say America first, and you would have to bow to the God that he wants you to bow to. So logically, don't argue to me that, that you're pro-free speech if you're going to make a statement like that. And also there's an interesting contradiction here where he's actually advocating for the fact that he's able to hire and fire and make decisions on his organization. He goes on in that same conversation to say, I would never hire someone from my organization who would not say these things. So it's okay for you to make hiring decisions based on whether or not you agree. But it's not okay for the Daily Wire or for others. So it's full of logical contradictions here. And this is, I'm not trying to interject my opinion in any of this because logic does stand alone. Let's take a look at some of the, the top. There was two video responses that I've seen thus far from Lauren Chin. I think there's actually more than that. Let's look at the top two comments on those videos and examine them through the question of, does this qualify? Even if it's not anti-Semitic, does this fall within that threshold of how a phrase such as Christ is King can be problematic? So the question is, is this problematic? In the Old Testament, individual Jews still choose or didn't choose salvation. The idea that they don't need to make that choice now and are on some pedestal is ridiculous. You're imposing that a, a certain religion needs to say what you want them to say. If it's not voluntary, is the journey real? If, if they just say, if I can just convince them, if I just hammer them enough to where they will bend the knee, and say the words that I want them to say, does that hold the same value as them going on the journey themselves and coming to that conclusion themselves? How then do you get them to go on that journey? Because it's one thing for me to say, hey, this has worked really well for me. You should, it could work well for you and to leave it at that. But if you cross beyond that threshold, that, that, that's something different. It's similar to when we're working with students. If you tell a student to, you have to do this because I say so. <laughs> or you lead through example, you show them why doing that assignment is necessary, why it's important to be able to think. Or you just tell them you need to do this, point by like, you're gonna have two very different outcomes. And what I said is that when you get these people who believe in this esoteric stuff and they really are devil worshipers, I said, these are people that you got to give the death penalty. I said, when it comes to like when I see these um, drag artists at the Padres thing and they're doing a, a dance on the crucifix and stuff like that, to me, that's satanic. I mean, that's a pretty glaring example, but it's interesting to me because when you hear a statement like that, Lauren Chin doesn't say a word. She just sips her water and keeps listening and just so the, the choosing uh, the choosing of outrage is what's some, interesting with here. some people there's very little you can what should her reply be to convince him that he's wrong that's not going to work well you do what you can for example and this is what i can do the choosing con when to be confused so tyt for example when we play that clip and they say huh as though it seems to me that normally if you were to post, if someone who is black makes a post on Twitter and someone then says, go eat some cornbread in the comment, TIT yeah, would, would, would have a problem tweet. with that. Yeah. But here they, they choose to be confused, it seems like. Saying eat some cornbread is not racist if I say it to my three-year-old when she's refusing her dinner. If I say it as a response to X post by black commentators, I don't like it. It has taken on a meaning beyond what is innate. Okay. I know they're doing like damage control again, but you don't know. Oh, that. I can't fire. I can fire. <laughs> See, I can't fire. No, they're trying to try to protect precise. themselves okay. from legal action from Candace Owens you don't or know potential that. legal action. You don't know that. You what can't you read someone's mind. Hmm? You can't read someone's mind, which is why. <laughs> Look, okay. When someone. The, the CEO, this is, let's I think bring you it, made it very clear. Let's bring it back to that diagram. The CEO of Papa John's. I don't care his, about the CEO of Papa John's. Let's conduct this thought experiment, please. It's, I think it'll be valuable. The CEO of Papa John's in a Zoom call 
They're thinking of hiring a public figure. I think you believe it was a rapper. He goes around saying the N-word a lot. The CEO of Papa John says, I don't want to hire this individual because he goes around saying the N-word. In that Zoom call, he actually said the N-word, right? He was then fired and every effort was made to destroy him as though he made the statement, he said the N-word in the context with the intent of being racist. But he was actually trying to say, it's not good to say this and that's why I don't want to hire them. Okay, so... Now, I'm not going to say what's right or wrong, whether that was right or wrong. Hang on one second. Go. If, if you find that problematic, that removing the intent behind that statement and that he should just saying the words themselves are enough to destroy someone regardless of intent, how is that different than saying if we remove it, that intent does not correlate to a statement, whether it's Crisis King or Pineapple on Pizza or whatever it is, that that statement, devoid of intent, is always, it's always right, devoid of intent, it doesn't matter. If a statement, logically, if a statement can always be right, it can logically also always be wrong. Another statement can always be wrong. So that's the logic that leads to actions similar to those that were surrounding the CEO of Papa John's. So if you find something like that problematic, we need to be logically consistent and see that how we arrive at treating speech in that way. And where, how do we arrive there? It's removing the intent, saying that intent doesn't matter, it's either always right or it's always wrong. There's no such thing as context or the intent behind the words, which goes back to that chart and why it's so important to recognize that words are not the end all be all, they're just the tools that we're wielding. How are we wielding those tools? Which is what Jeremy Boring's point was about a shovel is a shovel. If you use it to kill someone, it then becomes a murder weapon. How we wield the tools. And so how our decisions are so important because how we use that speech, how we use that phrase is going to determine how it is viewed. So Black Lives Matter is now viewed as something more than just saying that black lives are valuable because of how it has been wielded.